Welcome everyone to our very last webinar of 2021. We're so pleased to have you with us today. My name is Laura Gousset. I'm one of the uh, presenters today and I'll also be the moderator for our webinar. And the title today is LSVT Loud and LSVT Big Year in Review. We're going to be looking at the research that came out in 2021 and uh, we're really excited to share this information with you. Along with myself, you'll meet my co-presenter, Heather Hodges, a speech language pathologist and one of the LSVT Loud training and certification faculty and clinical expert as well. I won't read our bios here for you, but to say that Heather is a speech therapist, I'm a physical therapist, and we've um, been with LSVT Global as instructors for quite a few years and have uh, in-depth knowledge of these treatment protocols. We are both employees of LSVT Global and receive lecture honorarium. We also have a treatment preference for the LSVT Loud and LSVT Big treatment techniques. So just a few le uh, webinar logistics in case this is your first time joining us in GoToWebinar. Right now, your microphones are muted so that there's no background noise from all of your environments, but at the end, there'll be an opportunity to ask your questions. At any time during the webinar, you can type your question into the control panel. It will either see, say questions or chat, and you can type that in. We'll probably um, answer those at the end of the webinar, but please note that uh, we will do our best to answer your questions related to the content that's being delivered today. Also in your control panel, you should see a little tab that says handouts on it. If you click on the triangle to the left of it, you should be able to open and uh, click on the handout if you wanna download it or print it or keep it. We'll also be emailing it to you after the webinar. If you can't figure out how to access your control panel, you might see an orange arrow at the top of your screen. If you click on that, that should expand the control panel so that you can um, view everything. Also, there's options on your control panel. If you're having any issues with video or audio, you can um, select those options as well to do some testing. At the end of the webinar, there will be a survey that will pop up, and we ask that you please answer and uh, look at that survey, respond to it. We really, really value your feedback. We use it for future webinar planning. And uh, if you have any additional questions that come up during the webinar that weren't answered, please list them on the survey. We'll be happy to get back to you personally. A little bit of information on continued education in case you're a therapist who's joining us today. This LSVT Global webinar is not ASHA or state registered for CEUs for speech, physical, or occupational therapists, but you can use it as self-reported CEU credit or non-pre-approved CEU activity. Um, if you would like to report your activity, simply email us at webinars at lsvtglobal.com to request a certificate, as long as you've completed the full um, hour of the webinar. Also in the future, if you're listening to this webinar in an on-demand or recorded format, you can um, answer a few questions, email webinars at lsvtglobal.com so that you can obtain a certificate as well that you can use for self-reported CE activities. These are the objectives that we'll be going over today. We'll be summarizing the framework for evaluating research evidence, recognize the potential for LSVT BEG to affect what's called occupational performance and hand function in people with Parkinson's disease, recognize the potential LSVT BEG has to improve function in persons with early to advanced Parkinson's disease, summarize new LSVT loud research in 2021, and also discuss implications of neural act activity changes post LSVT loud. So just a quick note before we start, um, the audience that's intended for this webinar is persons with Parkinson's or other neurological disorders, um, families, friends, lay professionals. However, therapists and healthcare professionals are um, really welcome to attend this webinar as well. If you are a healthcare professional and want a more in-depth review of these treatment studies that we'll be discussing today, uh, we did webinars earlier this week on Monday and Tuesday that will be available in our blog at uh, blog.lsvtglobal.com under the webinar. So you'll be able to access those recordings uh, within a day or two if you'd like that more in-depth review of the research. So let's start off with a poll. Um, first of all, we'd love to know who's joining us today. If you're a person with Parkinson's or another diagnosis, 
a family or friend of someone with uh, Parkinson's, PT or OT professional, um, speech language pathologist, or maybe someone else. And so let me just launch this poll so that you can answer it live. And it should take more than a couple of seconds to answer it. I'll give you just a few more seconds. Looks like almost everyone has voted. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and close that poll now. And it looks like about half of you are a person with Parkinson's or another diagnosis. 8% family or friends, 8% PT or OT professionals. 25% SLPs and 8% other. So thank you for that. That really helps us greatly to gear our information as much as possible to those of you who are joining us. So I'll be kicking off this first part of the webinar. I'll be talking about the LSPT big research um, as I'm a physical therapist. And then Heather will spend the last half of the webinar really discussing the highlights of the LSPT loud research that has come out over the past year. So if you're not familiar with LSVT Loud or LSVT Big, or you're not really sure what the difference is between them, I know oftentimes they're referred to as the Big and Loud program, uh, but they are indeed separate therapies. These are standardized therapy protocols. They're grounded in 30 years of NIH-funded research and clinical experience. LSVT Loud designates the speech therapy, and LSVT Big designates the physical or occupational therapy. And these protocols are always delivered by physical therapists, occupational therapists, or speech language pathologists that are certified um, in these treatment protocols. And just a little bit of word about the type of research. I think as a person with Parkinson's, um, you might not be familiar with all of the phases of research unless you're in a healthcare profession or a science-based profession as well. So just a word about um, these phases of research. Phase one would be considered the discovery to detect if there's a therapeutic effect, look at the population that might be applicable to, um, develop the protocol and the dosage. And then phase two is to, you know, take that information from phase one to define and refine the protocols. Um, and, the, and look at the outcomes as well. Phase three then is really um, what we call developing the gold standard of evidence. This would include randomized controlled trials and really establishes the efficacy and test the efficacy of the treatment um, if the treatment research turns out with positive results. And then phase four would include um, real world practice and implementation, expanding the treatment to potentially other different populations, looking at different service delivery models. And then stage five would be implementation into standard of practice. So for the LSVT loud and LSVT big protocols, we definitely have both phase one and phase two research and also phase three research with multiple randomized control trials for LSVT loud. And it is considered the gold standard of speech treatment for Parkinson's disease globally. LSVT Big is newer, but also to date has four randomized control trials, and its body of literature um, continues to grow as well. So here's some questions to kick it off. Did you ever wonder? If you're familiar with LSVT Big, maybe you know a little bit about it, but definitely you have some questions about it and its uh, effectiveness as well. Um, you might wonder: Can it be used to improve hand function and one's ability to get dressed? or does it only improve walking and balance? How long do the effects of LSVT big last? Can LSVT big be used with people who have advanced Parkinson's disease? And can LSVT big be provided via telehealth? So the studies that we'll be reviewing today will attempt to begin to address these questions. The same thing with LSVT loud, you might have heard of the treatment, but really have some in-depth questions about it. Does being louder translate into a voice others can understand better or just hear better? How is the voice quality impacted by Parkinson's disease? 
And can these be improved along with vocal loudness? Is there any evidence that people with PD actually learn a new way of speaking after LSVT Loud? And how can people with voice disorders successfully engage with technology? So in terms of the LSVT big research studies, these are the ones, the topics that we'll, we are going to be looking at today, hand function and what are called occupational performance outcomes. We'll be looking at a telehealth case report. We'll be looking at quality of life and one year um, post-treatment effects in a person with early PD. And we'll also be looking at an advanced PD case report. So let's start off with this one. Um, on occupational performance and hand function in, uh, with Parkinson's disease after participation in LSVT BIG. So the researchers in this study were occupational therapists associated with the Louisiana, um, State, or Louisiana State University, and they wanted to examine occupational performance and hand function outcomes of people with Parkinson's who had participated in LSVT BIG. So this was a retrospective chart review. They looked at 66 individuals with Parkinson's disease who had received outpatient physical therapy and occupational therapy utilizing the LSVT big protocol. The measurements they used were the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure called the COPM, the Minnesota Manual Dexterity Test, and Grip Strength. Now you might think um, occupational performance relates to a person's job and to some extent that's true, but it's a term that's used in uh, the world of occupational therapy. And I think for the context of today's webinar, it might be useful to give you an overview or a definition of what that means. And basically it's a broad word used to describe a person's ability to perform their required activities, tasks, and roles of living. So these could be related to taking care of yourself. Um, it could be related to work activities like typing or writing or uh, manual work if a person has a manual labor job. It could be related to leisure activities, taking care of their family. So it's really broad and it really just means doing the things that you need to do as a human being in whatever roles that you um, occupy in your life. The Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, just a quick note here, it's used to assess a patient's outcomes in those same areas of self-care, productivity, and, le and leisure. So it uses an interview and it's a five-step process which measures a person's problem areas and daily function. It is evidence-based and it attempts to capture a client's own perception of their performance in everyday living over time. So in this study, as I said, it was a retrospective chart review. So this was real world clinical practice, not in a laboratory. They looked at patients in an outpatient um, based hospital setting who received LSVT big. In this setting, LSVT big was delivered by an occupational therapist who was certified in LSVT big that did two days per week of the protocol and then a LSVT big certified PT who did the other two weeks of the protocol. So LSVT big is always delivered four times a week for four weeks over 16 sessions. So in essence, OT did half of it and then PT did half of it. Participants identified their occupational performance priorities using that Canadian occupational performance measures. And some of the goals that they um, included were things like washing their feet independently, using their left hand, we assume that's their more impacted hand, um, putting on their seatbelt independently, being able to hold a baby, um, improve brain memory. So they were all very, very functional things, oftentimes utilizing their hands, um, which so much of what we do as human beings does require use of our hands. So these were the results. Um, they identified occupational performance goals that were meaningful to them. So each person's goals were really unique from one another. And they de all demonstrated significant pre to post changes. And the improvements range from three to six points for performance and satisfaction. Also, grip strength was improved. You can see the improvement in the right hand uh, was about nine pounds in the left hand um, also went from 52 to 63 pounds, so a bit more. They measured dexterity using a standardized test called the Minnesota Manual De Dexterity Test, 
and you can see that the median time decreased from 124 seconds to 119.5. So this is a standardized task where they would have to um, move um, these small objects, kind of like large pegs, and they were able to do it faster and more efficiently. So what does this all mean for people that have Parkinson's disease? First of all, LSVT Big can be tailored to help you improve your ability to do basic things that are important to you, like getting dressed, fastening buttons, writing, and so on. And it's very much individualized uh, so that you are working on goals that are important to you. Also, your hand strength and dexterity really can improve with this intensive treatment. And lastly, occupational therapists who are LSVT Big certified play a huge role in improving function in many ways that will result in improved satisfaction and quality of life. Uh, right now, about two thirds to three fourths of our LSVT Big certified clinicians are physical therapists and the rest are occupational therapists. But we strongly believe that occupational therapy has a huge and vital role in improving function in people with Parkinson's disease. So if you are a person with PD who is listening and, and you haven't um, received LSVT big yet, just a note when you're searching for a clinician, um, it is valuable to receive uh, therapy from both PT and OT as they did in this treatment study um, so that really your function is addressed comprehensively, looking at not only mobility but hand function, and uh, activities of daily living as well. The second study is about telehealth. So this was a case study. Um, the world of telehealth in physical and occupational therapy is very new. And one of the silver linings of the pandemic was that it really um, began to blossom for the first time. And um, Medicare allowed for um, authorization and payment because of the pandemic for telehealth, for persons um, with not only Parkinson's, but other diagnoses as well. And so it, it's been a wonderful thing. And I think there is a, a lot of room for growth in terms of our clinical practice and research. This was uh, one of the very first things that was published on use of telehealth uh, related to LSVT big. So uh, this person in this case study was young, 46 years old. He had had PD for about uh, four years, so he had young onset Parkinson's disease, and he was still in the early stages, uh, a hone in yard stage two, and that's a, uh, a one to five scale or a zero to five scale. They did a variety of different measurements. They did something called a nine hole peg test that looks at dexterity of the hands, a mini best test, which is a balance test, um, 10 meter walk test, which is a gait speed test, 30 seconds sit to stand, that measures how many times a person can stand up and sit down within 30 seconds. And then their UPDR S3, which are motor scores usually used by um, a neurologist. This article is open access. So if you want to uh, look at the whole thing, read it, download it, I put the URL here for you. So what they did was provided LSVT big um, via telehealth. However, the evaluation and the discharge examination were at the patient's home in person because they really wanted to um, evaluate him, see if he was safe enough in terms of his balance, see what his space was like, um, to make sure that telehealth was safe and appropriate for him. They also helped him to establish the space in his home where LSVT big um, could be safely done. As you can imagine from the name, it takes up a, a lot of room to move with huge movements when you are looking at stepping forward, backwards, sideways, uh, working on functional activities. So um, that all went well with him. He was already really familiar with teleconferencing because he worked in IT. He was already on Zoom all the time. Um, they did give him some therapy equipment that he could utilize, like some foam balance pads, some resistance bands, cuff weights, some things like that that he would need for his sessions. And um, then they provided the whole 16 sessions of treatment four times a week for four weeks via telehealth. So what you can see here is just a summary of his treatment results. You can see in the uh, evaluation column where he was initially, his scores were actually um, fairly high, but after four weeks, and then they also reassessed him six months later, 
Uh, his balance improved significantly on the mini best test. Even after six months, it was better. His gait speed also improved, and the MDC stands for a minimal detectable change. It's the amount of change needed to be detectable. Um, 30 seconds sit to stand, he went from 15 repetitions within 30 seconds to 24 and eventually 26, which is pretty impressive considering the treatment ended after four weeks. His dexterity improved. You can see that um, the time it took him in his right hand decreased, but it wasn't maintained at six months. And then his UPDRS3 score, which was also really low, did drop, but it wasn't enough to uh, meet the MDC. Most importantly was his comments, right? Really is what it matters to the patient. So he noted he had increased ease and amplitude with movement patterns, um, most significant changes in gait, posture, and energy level. And his patient and family noted he had better voice volume during conversation, which is kind of interesting considering that wasn't even really worked on. At work, he noted improved typing and handwriting ability. And most importantly, he described the ability to think big. In, in LSVT big, we call that, he was calibrated. He was grateful to be able to access treatment in his own home without the barrier of a two hour commute. He would, he would have faced an in-person treatment. And I should have noted that um, the reason why this gentleman was provided with telehealth was because he did live two hours. He lived in a very rural area and he was not close to an LSVT big certified clinician. He was also a dad um, with five kids and worked full time. So this was really a great, great solution for him. And if you're a person with Parkinson's listening, um, here's some take home points for you. Telehealth can be really, really wonderful, can reduce some barriers to receiving LSVT big for people like him who live in rural areas or don't have a clinician nearby, Maybe there's transportation difficulties, and maybe there's a work scheduling burden as well. He had positive objective and subjective improvements in this case, but of course it's a case study, so we can't generalize that to everyone. And for a lot of people, it reduces their risk of exposure to COVID-19 um, to be able to uh, have this treatment remotely. Some considerations because the therapist wasn't able to physically touch the patient, they had to use some extra cues. Um, it was really important to address fall risk and for people that maybe are at mild fall risk, the therapist might need to adapt some of the movements to a seated position, give them support or have a caregiver there who can be there for safety. Not every person may be safe to receive LSVT big via telehealth and so that's a really a one case by case decision um, by the therapist. The patient has to be familiar with technology and also they have to have adequate, adequate internet bandwidth and speed to support video streaming like that. Another case study I'll just briefly go over is looking at um, the short term effect of LSVT big on quality of life and they also followed up with a person with early PD one year later as well. Um, this was a 63-year-old female. She had um, stage two Parkinson's disease. And they looked at her um, quality of life using the PDQ39, her movement using the UPDRS, and her gait speed using the timed up and go and 10 meter walk test. Um, they did LSVT big per protocol. This was delivered by a physical therapist in an outpatient setting and the patient worked really hard every session to high effort levels. The patient had no cognitive deficits and at evaluation, the patient had stiffness, what, call, what we call rigidity, that she had slow movements and she had some walking impairments as well. The functional things that she worked on were getting out of a chair, climbing stairs, stepping over obstacles, turning, uh, standing one leg, presumably to get her pants on and also walking long distances with dual tasking. Some improvements that she made short term, her quality of life scores improved uh, from an 83 to 44, so really huge gains on that score. Her movement improved, we see an improvement in her MDS UPDRS score and improvements in toe tapping, her agility of her legs and her gait. Um, rigidity was the same and her walking speed improved a little bit as well. Those gains were maintained or improved after one year, which was really exciting. And we presume this is due to her continued home exercise practice. 
So one of her quotes was, it became easier to walk and moreover, I can walk with my husband. Um, we can assume not behind her husband, but actually with her husband. Some take home points. There is potential for long-term retention of improvements in quality of life, movement, walking uh, with LSVT big. Um, and again, this is a case study, so we can't generalize it to everyone. Uh, but in this case, she was able to maintain those improvements. And it might be because the exercises are called multimodal. They're working on balance, amplitude, agility, uh, many different things. She worked intensively and she was able to be calibrated and understood what it felt like to move in this bigger and better way. And she continued with her home practice on a religious basis. Um, the effects that she gained were really similar to other previous studies done on LSVT big. So she was really happy to be able to walk more easily and also um, just, you know, have a better quality of life. The last one is um, the opposite, someone with advanced Parkinson's disease from the same author, Hirakawa. All the references are going to be listed at the end of today's webinar. So they wanted to see, does LSVT big have the potential to improve someone's function if they have advanced Parkinson's disease? This was a 77-year-old woman. She was at a stage four. Remember, there's five stages in Parkinson's disease with a honden yar scale. She had been on medication for 25 years. She had a history of frequent falls. She was using a rollator outside. She needed help for her ADL, so um, quite a bit of assistance. Again, they looked at her motor scores, her walking ability, uh, her balance scores, and her sit-to-stand speed as well. Again, she had LSVT big by LSVT big certified physical therapists. They started off the exercises in sitting, and as she improved in her balance, they were able to progress to standing. Functionally, she worked on stepping over obstacles, reaching some hand tasks, a sit to stand, getting up to the table, and using chopsticks to pick up noodles. With walking, she was able to walk with a larger arm swing and stride length. Um, you can see the improvements noted here on the UPDRS. Remember that the minimal detectable change is five points, so she was able to exceed that. Her walking speed did improve a little bit. Um, as seen by her timed up and go score in the 10 meter walk, her Berg balance score improved a lot, um, showing a somewhat reduced risk of falling. She was able to get up out of a chair much more quickly and all of those improvements were significant. So some last take home points. In this case, uh, the person was able to improve on those um, functions and mobility, which were really helpful for her in everyday life. So uh, sometimes therapists and patients are wondering, well, if a person has advanced PD, is it safe to you know, have intensive training and practice? And, and yes, clinically, I can tell you, we know that um, even people with advanced PD have great potential to improve, but it only comes if the therapists themselves are not afraid to um, push them within safe limits and to provide adequate repetition of practice so that they can really learn a new way of moving, more like it was um, in prior years when their symptoms were milder. One of her quotes was, it became easier to walk in particular, it became easy to take a forward step. And in someone that has freezing of gait, just being able to initiate walking and take that first step can be a really, really important thing. She also said it became easy to use chopsticks. In particular, the food does not slip from the chopsticks. Um, and again, the being able to feed oneself um, not only is empowering, but helps to maintain dignity of a person. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Heather, who's gonna walk you through the LSVT Loud research studies. Thank you so much, Laura. That was really interesting to learn about those advancements that have been made in the last year and the applicability of the um, LSVT big to the different severities and, and for those folks at home. So thank you so much for that. And I am excited to present to you all the new LSVT Loud research studies um, from the last year, 2020 to 2021. And I will be focusing on research um, in the realms of speech intelligibility and voice quality, 
neural imaging, which is really exciting to see changes that occur at the level of the brain, specifically cerebral blood flow to the brain from this therapy. I will also be very excited to talk to you about LSVT um, and our involvement with Google and their project Euphonia, where they're aiming to make technology and voice recognition systems work better for individuals. And then not listed here, I will cap it off with a brief talk about some of the case studies that have occurred um, that apply this therapy to other diagnoses. Um, so that's where we'll head. And first, I'd like to start about talking about intelligibility and voice quality. These are the references for these papers, which are quite exciting. I'll go through them um, uh, uh, sort of as a group because they all highlight how one month of LSVT loud therapy improves how easy it is for us to be heard by other people following the therapy, as well as our vocal quality, how clear our voice is. So for those of you interested in the full citations, I have those listed here, but in the next slide, we will break down and talk first about intelligibility. So when we think about intelligibility, this refers to how well we are understood by others when we speak. One of the um, uh, hallmarks of Parkinson disease, and in fact, what some people report is their first symptom of their Parkinson disease, is feeling like people are, are misunderstanding our speech or asking us to repeat ourselves. And so certainly this was a big focus in some of our randomized control trials that we did, um, but really nice to have this evidence continue to come out that further bolsters that initial um, gold standard efficacy data. So the two studies that are listed here are the Levy et al. and the Schultz et al. papers. The first study was involving 64 subjects and it was self-generated speech. It was speech that the patients were coming up with um, on their own. It wasn't a set of reading materials they were performing. It was truly self-generated speech. And the, ac the um, raters were transcribing the speech of these individuals pre-treatment and post-treatment. And it was really exciting to see that the change in accuracy improved with LSVT loud. It was compared to um, a comparable in intensity and tasks treatment that focused just on articulation. Articulation refers to how well we enunciate our words and that didn't have the same impact. So it's not just that it's intensive therapy having the impact, it truly is that voice being the target in therapy such as it is with LSVT loud really makes the difference. Not only was it found that um, intelligibility improved, but also that loudness improved in that group as well, where loudness did not improve when articulation was the treatment focus. And then both groups were also compared to a no treatment group. And in that group, um, uh, there was no noticeable change. And in fact, in loudness, they had a decrease in their loudness level. The Schultz et al. study looked at single word um, and it was marked as a percent accuracy score. And what was cool about this data is that it, it not only looks at intelligibility, but it also looks at what happens to how well people understand us when we're in background noise. This is a frequent um, complaint that we get when we talk to our patients that they can't be heard in a restaurant or even when they're at home entertaining and there's a group of people at the dinner table, they feel like they're being ignored. And so looking at that um, percent correct score in single words, they also noted that when 
looking at three different treatment groups, the LSVT loud group, an articulation group, and a non-treatment group, that it was the LSVT loud therapy that showed a significant improvement in the percentage correct. So how well those folks were understood, even in background noise conditions. And so that increase in loudness is also positively associated with an increase in word intelligibility. And vocal loudness promotes increased intelligibility more than a focus on articulation or how people are enunciating. And this is really important because nearly 90% of those with Parkinson's disease develop speech signs that substantially impair their intelligibility. It results in a loss of communication and in quality of life. Um, so considering that occurrence, having a therapy that really addresses that and positively impacts is really um, heartwarming and, and truly awesome to see. In the same vein, looking at voice quality, voice quality is also impacted um, in Parkinson's disease. And so when we think of voice quality, you can think of it as the clarity of someone's voice, how clear someone's voice is. And so to um, have an opposite example of someone who does not have a clear voice, perhaps they're hoarse, raspy, um, very breathy, and hard to um, listen to sometimes. And, you know, the importance of vocal quality and communication and decreased communication effectiveness in those with Parkinson's disease are well established in the medical research. And so they, um, the authors of this study, which is in review currently, they used um, a voice quality index. So it's called the AVQI, the Acoustic Voice Quality Index. And they took measurements pre-treatment, post-treatment, and at a six-month follow-up. And findings in terms of voice quality indicated that when treatment was focused on voice, so LSVT loud, in other words, when treatment was focused on voice, that led to the greatest improvement in vocal quality versus articulation or versus a non-treatment group. And additionally, the voice treatment group was the only one to have increases in their loudness levels, much like those intelligibility studies that I just mentioned. Um, and that loudness was present not only in the sustained ah, uh, but also in reading tasks. And so for those of you attending that have Parkinson's disease, the take home points that I want to leave with you on these studies are that LSVT loud improves how well others understand the speech of those with Parkinson's compared to those patients who did not have treatment or patients who had intensive treatment but was focused on enunciating. So even if you're an individual and you're noticing, well, I think my voice might be okay, but gosh, I mumble or my speech gets slurred. Articulation treatment did not have the same um, effect on intelligibility or impact on loudness that the voice therapy did. We also recognize that LSVT loud improves vocal quality, improves that clarity of voice, um, while alongside also improving loudness levels. And that these improvements in speech intelligibility after LSVT loud has long lasting positive impacts. So looking at that data six months post-treatment, um, it's really exciting to see those uh, changes persist and continue to improve for some um, after their treatment course. And switching gears now, we'll talk about um, uh, neural studies, so studies of the brain. So in this study titled Immediate and Long-Term Effects of Speech Treatment Targets and Intensive Dosage on Parkinson's Disease Dysphonia, 
and the speech motor network. This was a randomized control trial, which as Laura mentioned earlier at the top of the presentation, those randomized control trials are getting to the phase three research. It really is um, an exciting means to see the changes occurring um, at that phase of research. And so, what they did was first compare acoustics. And so they had a measurement for um, indicating the severity of dysphonia. And that was with the, um, I think we have it on this slide, the septal peak prominence. And so just know that that's a measurement of how severe someone's voice and speech is when they're talking. And they took that data and then they also looked at brain scans measuring blood flow before and after treatment. And they looked also at groups that um, one group had the LSVT treatment, another group had the um, LSVT articulation treatment, and then there was also a non-treatment group for this study as well. And so I think the saying an image is worth a thousand words definitely is shown on this next slide when we look at these brain scans. And so uh, you'll see each row of images is a different part of the brain. All of these parts of the brain have to do with speech production as well as how um, our feedback for how we're producing speech, how accurately are we um, getting that feedback of our own voice coming out and how it sounds and how loud it sounds to other people. Now, when we look at this and just kind of as a, a brief overview, when the colors are lighting up more in the yellows and oranges, that shows increased flow. Um, we do see increased flow with the reds as well. Areas of the brain that are not having any increased blood flow are just gonna remain more of that gray color. In the columns going from left to right, we start with the baseline. So before therapy, these are the three areas of the brain. And you can see in that first column um, that those slides are, are showing a lot of gray. <laughs> There's really no yellow that's indicating there. Post-treatment, we have two brains in this sort of middle column. Um, the first, on the left side is the voice treatment. And the second, immediately post-treatment, those four weeks of therapy, is the articulation treatment. And here we're starting to see more color, so that is a good thing. And we see more color for both intensive treatments, the voice and the articulation. But where we really get excited is at the seven-month follow-up. Again, looking at voice treatment and articulation treatment, we are seeing more yellows. We're seeing more of those um, bright spots for the voice treatment at seven months after therapy has concluded versus the articulation group, which is now looking more in the oranges and the reds and less in the yellow. And in fact, on that bottom row with the auditory cortex, we're seeing um, a lot more activity for the voice treatment than the articulation. And so lots of information on this slide, but what I essentially want to leave you with is that it was only the voice treatment group that had the biggest change in the severity of dysphonia. They had the most positive improvement in their dysphonia, and this correlated with brain activity in the voice group. The no treatment group showed a progressive decrease in activity um, across all the three areas of the brain that were examined. Um, and at seven month follow up, while there were improvements for the voice and articulation treatment groups, it was only the voice treatment, the LSVT loud treatment group, that had a significant improvement in the auditory cortex. And that area of the brain is our feedback system. It's how we are um, uh, subsystem. It's one of the ways that we hear our voice, understand if our voice is loud or too loud, if it's um, how it's coming across to our listeners, in other words. So 
very exciting and the take home points with all that data that's presented and those images, uh, the take home points I'd like to leave you with for this study is only LSVT loud showed improvement to dysphonia and lasting increased neural activities in the area of the brain that was examined. And again, this is seven months post therapy. Intensive therapy that focused on articulation, that idea of how clearly we enunciate, didn't show that same degree of lasting improvement for dysphonia, nor to the activation of the auditory cortex. And even within the month where the other subjects were receiving treatment, um, and then certainly at seven months um, after those patients had treatment, the subjects that were assigned to the no treatment group had a decrease in, uh, and it was a progressive decrease in activity over time in those speech centers the, and auditory um, feedback centers, and they had persisting dysphonia as well. All right, and um, I mentioned earlier that I wanted to talk about new clinical cases. So these are the various other disorders. Um, you know, the level one research efficacy data for LSVT loud exists and has been well established in the Parkinson disease population. And now we're examining to how can LSVT loud impact other voice disorders, other neurological disorders. And we have um, listed here autism spectrum disorder, um, individuals with multiple sclerosis, children with cer uh, cerebral palsy and drooling, children with Down syndrome, an adult with cerebral palsy. Um, and then another study that examined adult with cerebral palsy and an adult with Wilson's disease. So we're starting to see this intense focus on voice with uh, high repetition, engaging, tailored treatment that works on generalization apply to other populations as well, which is very cool. And it helps to add to our understanding of of how the speech system changes with this treatment and how uh, these key concepts of focusing on target of voice and loudness, an intensive mode with high effort and calibration, how those concepts are applicable for a range of neurological disorders and a variety of dysarthria types. Now, the last study listed here is about spasmodic dysphonia. Spasmodic dysphonia is a condition where it's neurological in basis, and the way that the vocal cords are opening and closing are inappropriate. Um, it can happen when the vocal cords open. It can happen when they close. Some people have it both ways. This is a really heartwarming video where you see someone affected. Um, the traditional therapy is Botox shots um, to actually paralyze those muscles in her case that helped to open her vocal cords because they were simply slamming shut. And so um, if we'll get that video queued up here so that you can see. Oh, you must. Oh, ow, this has to be funny. I never left the appointment with all the food, with all the food and things and drinks. Yeah, baby. Today is June 23rd. I am on day four of LSVT Loud therapy and um it hasn't been easy where are you going are you doing well dinner is ready you are welcome i'd like you to clean up i'm so proud of you nice to meet you will i see you later 93, fill it up. Answer the phone, please. 
Where are you going? Are you doing well? Tara's ready. You're welcome. I'd like you to clean up. I'm so proud of you. Nice to meet you. I see you later. 93, fill it up. Answer the phone, please. Hi, everyone. I finished LSVT Loud Voice Therapy just about a month ago, and I'd love for you to hear what my functional phrases sound like now in comparison to day four of LSVT. Where are you going? Where are you going? Are you doing well? Are you doing well? Dinner is ready. Dinner is ready. You are welcome. You're welcome. I'd like you to clean up. I'd like you to clean I'm up. So I'm so proud of you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Will I see you later? Will I see you later? 93. Fill it up. 93. Answer fill it up. The phone, Answer the phone, please. So as you can see, there's a huge difference from then to now, and there are literally almost no barriers in terms of what I can say, and it's amazing. Hey, stop it! <laughs> so really truly heartwarming and that nice um idea and and the science that's catching up with um how working on voice and loudness can be this central organizing theme throughout the motor speech system and can improve respiration, vocal fold movement, articulation, um, and really a nice difference. I mean, that that pre-treatment uh, voicemail that was recorded versus four weeks um, at the end there where she's able to talk to the camera and we can understand her. So really exciting to see those changes occurring in other populations too. A piece of ongoing research that I wanted to talk to you about, um, LSVT has partnered up with Google. Google has a mission for improving voice recognition software for individuals with um, Parkinson's disease and other voice and speech issues as well. So on the next slide, this is um, some more of that detailed. It is an early stage project, and we're working with the engineers to increase accessibility to automatic speech recognition. Um, they have worked with other disorders such as ALS, Down syndrome. Currently, we are in a project working with those with Parkinson disease or Parkinsonisms, whether it's um, maybe PSP, MSA, CBD, um, post-brain, deep brain stimulation surgery. We know um, that being able to interact with everyday technology, so smart devices, computers, phone, it'd be great to send a text message using talk to text so that you're not having to try to type on your tiny phone pad, um, but those voice recognizers sometimes have difficulty with those who have voice and speech issues. We, um, and their goal is to maintain independence, increase safety um, by, you know, perhaps being able to use devices such as um, Google, turn on the lights or control my thermostat on Nest. And that can really enhance qual uh, communication and quality of life. So the project is called Project Euphonia and it's truly committed to make technology work better for everyone. We've had several phases of research with them, figuring out the best way to get the appropriate voice samples for their engineers, figuring out how to best support participants through the project so that it's really easy. It's a fun, easy um, research study, and you get to work with a speech language pathologist mentoring you through. And we've learned a lot in our first three phases, a pilot study and then phase one and phase two research. Our current phase, we have a goal of enrolling 400 people with a Parkinson's or Parkinsonism diagnosis. Right now we have data for 100. And so um, we're a long way from our goal of 400 participants. And what we are needing are phrases to be recorded. 
They are simple, short phrases that individuals in the study will record online. And so nothing to install or download, anything like that. And it's um, all transmitted through the cloud. So you truly don't have to really be very hands-on with the technology, but with recording these short reading passages that are a sentence long, this helps to improve and train the computers. Um, we do have an interest form. If there is anybody attending today that has interest or perhaps a friend or family member, or we have, I know professionals that are logged on today, if you have any patients that you think would be appropriate or interested in this study, uh, we are in the recruitment phase. And so we have a flyer here. If you um, have questions, you can email project.euphonia at lsvtglobal.com. That's listed on the flyer that's in your handout. You can visit our website to learn more. Um, and then there's also a register now button if you access this um, online. There's a QR code if you like to use your phone for the QR code scan. So there's multiple ways to get in touch with us if you are interested. And so in the summary, there are new and emerging research um, on LSVT Big and LSVT Loud, which continues to inform and, and to shape, to transform our practice and understanding of these treatments to provide better care for the people who receive it. The research continues though to be needed in many areas, including the application of LSVT big and LSVT loud to other neurological disorders and to persons with advanced Parkinson's disease. We're also seeking to better understand changes in function that's identified through occupational performance measures and changes in important non-motor symptoms. Larger studies are certainly needed in general, along with the addition of randomized control trials to compare treatments and study effectiveness. And the ongoing study of LSVT Loud continues to fortify the over 30 years of research on this effective treatment for those with Parkinson's disease, and it's extending to other diagnoses, which is very exciting. And with that, um, that concludes the content of our webinar, but we always like to open up the last couple of minutes for questions. And so the ways to answer questions include typing a question into the box on your control panel of the GoToWebinar. You can raise your hand, that's the little hand icon in your control panel. And if you um, run out of time, because I know we're approaching the top of the hour, or if you have a question that occurs to you later, you can always email us at info at lsvtglobal.com. And that email inquiry will be routed to the clinician or to the set of professionals that can best answer that for you. Laura, do we have any questions that have come in um, currently? Not currently, but I'll give it a couple more minutes. I know it takes people a little time to type in questions. Um, while we're doing that, I'll just give you a little bit more information about January. It's going to be 2022, if you can believe that. And we are actually uh, moving forward into a new year, but stepping back in the history of LSVT. We receive a lot of questions about what does LSVT stand for? Um, what are the origins of it? How did it start? How did that idea come about? And we're going to spend a full hour looking at this really, really interesting story about the inception of LSVT Loud, how it evolved over the years and led to LSVT Big and LSVT Loud for kids as well. If that's a topic that is interesting to you, the webinar will be on Wednesday, January 26th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. And uh, this audience will be really for anyone. It can be for allied health professionals, people with PD, other neurological conditions, et cetera. And it's free as all of our webinars are. You can register at blog.lsvtglobal.com and then look for the events tab, scroll down to the January events. So I do think a question has come in. Um, just also a note for you too, all of the references that we discussed today and a few additional ones that we didn't have time to 
are listed on these ending slides. You'll be able to find those in your handouts. You can see that all of the links are here if you want to go online and uh, you know look them up. Some of them are free open access articles. All right, so some great questions. And if you have to um, get going and get back to your busy day, uh, that's totally fine. And we really thank you for joining us today. All right, so first question that came in, how much therapy is necessary to reap the benefits of the program? Um, how often? Thanks. So yeah, Kent, I will answer that first, and then I'll turn it over to Heather, who can talk about LSVT Loud. Um, so LSVT Big and LSVT Loud are standardized protocol, and the research that's been done over the last 30 years is based on this standardized dosage of four times a week for four weeks, one hour sessions, and that's the dosage that initially was found to be effective and continues to be noted as being effective in the ongoing research studies. Um, on top of that, patients that go through these programs have uh, requirements to do exercises on their own about once or twice a day during the month of treatment. Those usually take 15 or 20 minutes. And then afterwards, um, ongoing daily exercise as well, usually about 15 to, per 20 minutes a day. Um, patients come back on average every six months for a short tune-up if they need it, just to make sure that they're maintaining their gains. Nothing has changed. If it has, we maybe give a few sessions of therapy to address those changes. And then a lot of people um, also participate in ongoing group exercise classes, Loud for Life and Big for Life, that help to maintain as well. Um, so that's really the basis, uh, basic in a nutshell. Just remember that LSVT Loud and LSVT Big are separate treatments. So those are each one month of, of initial treatment. And I think I got it all, right, Heather? Yes, I absolutely <laughs> concur. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, so next question. Um, how is LSVT information disseminated to medical professionals, namely neurologists? We heard about LSVT by accident, yes, and our neurologist at two major medical centers and said it's only for speech therapy and only for PD. Um, yes, so Laura, I'll answer this question from um, uh, uh, LSVT big PT perspective, um, as it, you noted that you heard only about the speech therapy part. So there's lots of different ways that information gets disseminated. Um, LSVT Global is really active in the Parkinson's community. We present and are present at most of the major international movement disorder conferences, like the Movement Disorder Society Conference, um, the World Parkinson's Congress, all of our um, professional therapy organization conferences. So that is one way that we interact with, with the community. Um, we also really try to um, empower our therapists to go out and speak to their local neurologists and physicians as well through uh, informational lectures. It could be a grand rounds or an in-service. We provide them with um, PowerPoint slides, um, handouts, research articles, references, et cetera so that they can go to their local neurologist and say, hey, I'm LSVT certified, here's what this, these treatments are. Um, I can provide treatment to your patients locally. Um, we're also uh, engaged in uh, different types of um, interactions with Parkinson's Foundation in the United States, uh, the APDA, a number of other ones. So it really is uh, on multiple levels that we engage. Um, we have webinars as well, and of course our website. But by and large, I think whether you're a neurologist or um, a clinician, word of mouth is always really big. And then all of these articles that we've mentioned um, tonight and today in our webinar are published in sometimes the journals that they read as neurologists and uh, the previous articles as well, um, they see those in the journals that come out. So I, I guess the, the bottom line story for you, whether you're a person with Parkinson's or a therapist, is uh, you can be one that is really an advocate and begins to share basic information with um, neurologists and physicians in your community about the LSVT programs. 
they are generally very good-hearted people that want to do anything and everything they can to help their patients. And so most of them are really, really happy and receptive to learn more about these evidence-based programs. Okay, um, Heather, I'm gonna give this next one to you. It says I'm a speech, or I am a Spanish speech therapist and I'm working with neurodegenerative diseases. Um, if I want to train, I wanted to train in LSVT loud, would I have to demonstrate some level of English? That is a great question. Um, so we do have speech language pathologists and as well as those that are certified in LSVT big um, on a global level. So um, I think all told there's like 58 different countries that the therapies are represented within. And so um, pre-COVID, it used to be that we would travel to different countries to train and certify. Um, now we're doing a lot with virtual online courses. And um, for example, we just wrapped up with uh, this 2021 year having presented to audiences in Germany and France and Japan. And so there are these virtual courses that occur um, with translators so that you can listen to somebody speaking in Spanish as they translate our presentation, our certification workshop. Um, I was looking at our schedule. I don't see any that are coming up for specifically Spanish speaking, but not to say that that one couldn't be coming down the line here. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I would say referring to the LSVT Global website on the certification page for therapists to help keep up to date for the courses as they are um, as they are added um, because we are working on the 2022 schedule. And mm -hmm. certainly if um, sometimes it just takes collaboration. If you are somebody who um, lives abroad in a Spanish speaking country or if your facility where you work, whether it's abroad or domestic, would be interested in hosting or, or collaborating to host a certification workshop, um, that's where these relationships get made. And so we're, we, we want to get the word out to um, as many people globally mm -hmm. as possible so that treatment is more accessible. There is an online loud self-paced um, um, certification workshop as well. Um, while it would be presented in English, it's something you can go at your own pace and perhaps um, uh, use like Google Translate or, or something of that nature, that might be more cumbersome for you, but that is a thought to look into, just depending on um, your comfort level with English at this point. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, anything yeah. to add, Laura? Yeah, I think that's great advice. And uh, to the person that wrote in this question, if you were able to comprehend our webinar today in English, I'm really confident you yeah. would able be able to access the the English online course that Heather was speaking about. It's also nice for uh, people because if you miss something, you can rewind and replay that as many times as you need to. Um, and then the other thing I was just gonna add is the treatment materials to be used for patients have been translated into multiple languages for both LSVT Loud and LSVT Big. And once you are certified, in LSVT Loud, you'll have access to all of those languages that you can use with patients with whichever languages are needed. And I, I think Spanish is one of those. I know it is for LSVT Big, um, but definitely that's something that we, we offer. Yeah, the, those are great points. And yes, I can confirm that there are materials in Spanish as yeah. well. That's, thanks for adding that. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all of the questions today. Um, really, really appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, wrapping up this great year, we're so grateful and thrilled to share all of this research with you. And really, we're grateful to all of the scientists and research um, partners that made this research possible because it not only is wonderful and informing, but ultimately it impacts the lives of people with neurological disorders like Parkinson's and the other disorders 
um, to lead better lives and receive treatment that is truly effective and life-changing for them. So just a shout out to those as well. All of our references can be found on our blog. There's a research tab that you can see um, at the top and you can narrow it down and look at just loud or just big or pediatric LSVT loud references. And we keep that updated as well. If you think of any questions at any time, please email us. We're super, super happy to receive your questions and give you the information that you're looking for. Just a reminder to um, fill out the survey and we thank you again and we'll see you in 2022. Great, thanks everyone.